Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on the NSP expenditure deadlines. This webinar is part of a series of open forum webinars with the HUD's NSP staff organized to help NSP grantees and partners prepare for the key expenditure deadlines under the program. The format for this webinar includes a presentation from HUD staff on the expenditure deadlines as well as a number of other current NSP topics. Following the HUD presentation, we will open up for questions from you for our HUD panelists. With us from HUD today, we have John Laswick, Hunter Kurtz, Jennifer Hilton, and Ryan Flannery. I am Jane Bilger from CSH, one of the NSP technical assistance providers and moderator for this webinar. Assisting with the webinar is Irene P. Wan, also from CSH. So let me now turn it over to um, John Laswick to start with the presentation from HUD on the expenditure deadline. Thanks, Jane. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for calling in today. Uh, we are uh, well into the uh, expenditure deadline um, season here with uh, a number of uh, NSP 1 and 3 deadlines uh, uh, arriving every day. Um, we're going to talk today about some ways to do this properly because, frankly, we're not getting it very right, folks. Um, we have a, a really high uh, error rate, and we have uh, about 25% or 30% of the uh, grantees that are missing the um, expenditure requirement, um, and a, a lot of those through just poor um, placement of numbers in the files, in the QPRs, and so forth. So we have our experts um, both from the uh, sort of management side as well as the DRGR side here today to um, help you get through that um, a little more comfortably. Um, and so um, we will uh, get started with that. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Hunter. And um, we'll start with the next, the next slide, which you may have seen before. Well, no. well, one more, one more. And just before we begin the Q&A again, we want to cover a couple different uh, subjects and issues that we're seeing. So next slide, please. So, just want to talk real quickly about the expenditure deadline. Uh, I know we've gone over this in the last couple of webinars, but I'll do it real quick here. Expenditure deadline is not close out. All you need to do for the expenditure deadline is have a uh, invoice or completed uh, you know, invoice for completed work. Uh, at close out, you need to have somebody. Uh, for instance, if you build, a, a acquire, and rehab a home, um, you need to have somebody in that home living to meet a national objective. So that's the difference. So expenditure deadline is you've paid for the acquisition and uh, rehabilitation of the home. Closeout is putting somebody in the house, meeting a national objective. So next slide, please. So what happens at the deadline? Um, if you meet the deadline, you'll receive a congratulations letter. Uh, if you meet the deadline uh, by 100%, but uh, you had a million dollars or 10% of your grant unspent two weeks before, uh, and that for NSP 1 and 3 is February 18th. We just sort of had to pick a day to try to make that two-week mark work, and in NSP 2, it was January 28th. You receive a conditional congratulations letter, and um, we're going to ask you to send in some documentation to your field office for a voucher review just to ensure that uh, there weren't any issues or mistakes made uh, as we met, uh, you know, as you tried to meet the, uh, the expenditure deadline. And just, just yesterday we found out that one of our illustrious NSP2 grantees might have missed the deadline unbeknownst to everyone, uh, through, and we got that information through the voucher review. So this is how we're doing quality control, and, and it really matters. Um, and then if you do not meet the deadline, uh, you will, re will receive a finding. Next slide, please. Um, you'll also have 30 days to update eligible expenditures in DRGR. So let's say your, uh, uh, your deadline is today. You'll have 30, deadline, uh, 30 days from today uh, just to basically reconcile your files. And that means that uh, any uh, eligible expenditures uh, 
So anything, if today's your deadline, any invoices that I get or you get um, for completed work that you have in hand today uh, counts as an eligible expenditure. That means that tomorrow, even though your deadline's over, you can put, um, you can go into DRGR and enter that information in it to, so that you can demonstrate that you met the, uh, uh, the deb deadline. Uh, if you cannot demonstrate after 30 days that you've met the deadline, then HUD will take corrective action. I also want to uh, mention that, you know, you get this invoice in hand today, you, uh, you enter it into DRGR tomorrow, you're also going to need to draw down and pay the, uh, the contractor, which is building the home for you. So you still have um, the ability to draw down funds for eligible expenditures. So you can put it in DRGR and draw it down uh, after today. I'd highly recommend you put it in before today or during today because um, that way you won't have issues with your field office and things like that. Um, uh, I mean, basically you're going to receive a finding if at the end of today you don't have in DRGR um, that you've met the expenditure deadline, but you can then demonstrate that you did and the finding can be uh, rescinded. All right. Next slide, please. So, uh, as many of you know, we uh, did, and this is coming to a quick end here, but we did a QPR extension um, for all NSP1 and NSP3 grantees um, that had met the uh, expenditure deadline. Um, they were able to, are still able to submit their QPR um, by March 15th, uh, and that is Friday. Um, that was because we were having some issues with DRGR, which uh, has sort of been uh, fixed and uh, DRGR is working faster than I've ever seen it work and it's just, it's a lot better. Uh, and um, just want to make sure everyone understands that this ex uh, expenditure deadline, or this is a QPR extension, not an expenditure deadline extension. Next slide, please. Oh, wow, it moves. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, do you want to Jen, talk about this. Um, so we just wanted to give you guys an update um, on the progress of these expenditure deadlines for NSP1 and NSP3. I think all of you know <clears throat> that these are sort of on a rolling deadline, so everyone has different deadlines. And so as of March 12th, um, the good news is that there are 116 NSP1 grantees that met the deadline and 152 NSP3 grantees that met the 50% expenditure deadline. If we go to the next slide, <clears throat> we'll talk about the not so good news, what John was referring to earlier. Pathetic news, I would say. Um, yeah, we're just a little disappointed in these numbers. Uh, as of March 12th, we had 30 grantees that did not meet the deadline. So 146 of the 307 grantees that we have, uh, so it's about half, have reached their deadline date. So of those, 30, 30 of those grantees did not meet the expenditure requirement. Uh, the biggest disappointment here is that a lot of this is because of uh, bad reporting. So 12 of those 30 grantees um, their drawdowns were much higher than their expenditures. So the picture is actually a lot better uh, than it looks because grantees um, have not been updating and verifying your expenditures in your QPR. Um, and we know there's been some issues with DRGR and the slowness and everyone was having um, issues with that, but we just, you know, as grantees approach your deadline, if you can get in your QPR and update those expenditures, so that they're correct. Um, you'll save yourself and our field offices a lot of work because um, all 30 of those grantees that didn't meet their deadline will be issued a finding by their field office, even if their drawdowns are over 100%. Um, we're basing it on expenditures. So you'll still be issued a finding, as Hunter mentioned earlier. So that's the 30-day period that Hunter was talking about that you have to, to get your records up to date is the, is the time to make those corrections. Right, and just a few steps in DRGR I think Ryan's going to talk about, um, and you can easily avoid getting that finding if you're over 100% drawn and you've expended 100% of your funds. So let's look at uh, the next slide. NSP3 is a little worse off, just a little bit. Um, we kind of expected that. 
So we've got 57 NSP3 grantees that have not met the 50% expenditure requirement. That's about 25% of the total that have met the deadline of 225. Um, but again, we see that 36 of those had really big discrepancies between drawdowns and expenditures. So even though 57 grantees are going to get these findings, it really wasn't necessary um, because the drawdowns, a lot of those drawdowns were over 50% or really close to 50%. So again, we just wanted to share these numbers with you and encourage all the grantees out there who haven't met their deadline yet to really get into DRGR and update your numbers. So next slide. I think we're going to turn it over to Ryan now. Hey, everybody. Uh, so we're just going to, going to do a quick refresher on entering expenditures in DRGR. And um, as, we, as we've discussed in, in several webinars in the past and, and today a bit, you know, the expenditures include the goods and services that you've paid for, uh, and these are manually entered, entered into the QPR. So that's different than the draws. The draws would come from the vouchers, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But for this particular screen, this would be in the QPR. I believe it's the second screen when you edit an activity. You're going to look for the, um, the field that's just below total funds expended. And just to the left of the editable field will be whatever responsible organization you've selected uh, that will be carrying out that activity or responsible for you know, performing those, those activities. You're going to enter that expended amount there for what took place in the current quarter only. Um, the column just to the right of that, which is the two date column, will show the two date amount of expenditures that have taken place. Now something I want to point out here is if for some reason you do not have an editable field in, this, in the you know, current quarter column, um, number one, check to make sure that you do have a responsible organization associated with that activity. And if you do, then number two, try reselecting that responsible organization if it's uneditable and you know that you have a responsible org associated with it. Sometimes that's just been a, a little workaround. The system gets hung up for some reason or it, uh, that responsible organization gets disconnected from that field and you just have to reselect it and that field usually is then editable again. I've had a couple of those instances come in in the past month or two. Um, the the only other time well the only time that you'll be entering expenditures that are uh, in addition to what took place in that particular quarter would be if you're entering expenditures uh, for past quarters that were that were not entered at the time. So if you had an expenditure that took place in fiscal year you know 2010 quarter two. Uh, you, and you didn't enter those at the time for that particular activity, you'll enter that amount here. So that means that if you have, let's say, $20,000 in expenditures that took place in this quarter and 10000 that took place in that previous quarter, you'll enter a total of $30,000. Then you'll enter, uh, in, in the narrative section, you'll enter what went where. You know, the $20,000 uh, for this quarter and the 10 that should have been reported that previous quarter, and you'll just you'll call those numbers out just to give your just to, to you know sh to show your rep and to show other folks who are reading your QPR that not all 30,000 uh, should have taken place in this quarter. But that's the alternative to us going back and opening up previous QPRs, which we do not like to do. So we can move to the next slide. Okay, and this is what I was discussing earlier. This is a financial report 07B. And this shows drawdowns, uh, so activity disbursements is what they're called, it's basically another term for drawdowns, and activity expenditures. And what we're doing here, what we're showing here is the difference between the two. Your disbursements are going to come from the vouchers that you have, you have uh, submitted in the system. So those are the actual draws that you've made or the program income that you've used. That's being pulled from the drawdown module when you pull this report. Now, the activity expenditures are being pulled from the QPR. Again, they're being pulled from that screen that we had just taken, we had just seen on the last slide. 
and that is being pulled from the QPR again. So they're, they're different. I, I know I've had to go over this a few times with folks. There's some confusion out there about where they look to see what their disbursements are compared to their expenditures. And just the nomenclature that's being used, expenditures means so many things to so many different people. What we're speaking, what we're talking here is DRGR language, HUD language uh, of what an expenditure is compared to a drawdown or disbursement. They are two different things. And um, we're just trying to point that out here. I think that's it. Next Thank slide. you, Ryan. Yes, we can go to the uh, the next slide. We'll hand it back over to Jen. Was anything else about expenditures? Uh, no, I just uh, uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, you know, we've had a number of people with problems with the DRGR system, uh, hard as that may be to believe. Uh, and uh, Ryan and and Mark and Jim have done a, a lot of work to get it back up and running smoothly, uh, but you know, the, you, can't, you can't put the wrong data in and get the right answers out. So I know Ryan was talking about responsible organizations. You don't want to be an irresponsible organization, uh, and so get your, get your data in there straight. Now, uh, we have a couple of things. Uh, we have a policy that's coming out this week, uh, finally, on uh, demolition and disposition, and Jennifer has devoted half her life to this policy guidance. So um, yeah, we're just going to do a super quick overview of this since the policy hopefully will be out, uh, let's say, tomorrow. Um, so you've probably already heard this if you were on our demolition webinar, but um, just a quick overview. Uh, so demolition, when it's just uh, demolition by itself, uh, we separate that into two considerations. So when you have acquisition and when you don't have acquisition, and at the end of the day, it's the same eligibility, it's LWSD, blighted properties, and the same national objective, you have to meet an area of benefit. Um, the difference is going to be when you acquire a property for demolition, you know, what do you do with it in the end? And we're going to talk about that a little bit with this position. Um, but we have this easy sort of chart that will be in the guidance piece, so it will help sort of be a cheat sheet for eligibility and national objective, which is, you know, the two most important things that uh, you want to do when you're trying to figure out if an activity is uh, going to work. And then demolition for housing activities, that's another sort of easy um, easy way to go because demolition does not have to be qualified separately as long as the, uh, the uh, reconstruction, <clears throat> excuse me, reconstruction or redevelopment of the property um, happens immediately after the demolition and the demolition is necessary for that redevelopment. So you can just classify those activities as part of your construction costs, whether it's reconstruction or redevelopment. Um, next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is a big thing I think everyone's thinking about. Um, so you've, you've invested uh, money in this property, let's say you've demolished it, and um, you've met a national objective with that demolition. So what happens now? Um, so you've met an area national objective with the demolition and you want to change uh, the national objective to, um, well, actually... Subsequent use. Right. So, okay, sorry, I'm like... So if you spend more than $25,000 on a property and you can no longer meet the area national objective that you met when you demolished it, what you have to do is you have to reimburse the NSC program for fair market value. And we're just making this distinction because if you never met a national objective, so let's say you acquired a property, you didn't know what to do with it, or it wasn't in a low mod area, and you never could meet a national objective, you have to reimburse NSP for all the funds you spent on that project. So everything, including the demolition costs, acquisition, everything you spent on that property, if you could never prove that you met a national objective, you have to reimburse the program. But on the flip side, if you, if you ha did meet a national objective with your demolition um, and you spent more than $25,000 on everything but demolition, so this is a sort of new thing that will be in the guidance too, when we're talking about total funds invested, we're actually talking about funds invested in the property that was an, an improvement to that property, and we do not include demolition 
for whatever reason, we don't include it as an improvement. So when we're talking about funds invested, you can take out your demolition costs um, and just include everything else. So if it's more than 25000 and you can no longer meet your area national objective that you've already met once, then you can reimburse the NSP program for fair market value. And probably in a lot of places that's going to be less uh, or could be less than what you, you know, spent on the property. If you spent less than 25000 then you're just going to want to come to your field office and the field office will bring in HQ and we'll have a discussion about, um, you know, how much was spent on these properties and whether or not you can just move those properties out of the program. And that's, again, assuming you met a national objective with your demolition first or with your land banking. Right. So, we, I mean, we bring this up because about a year ago we had thought that we would be able to use this $25,000 or less as a, as a way out of the program. Um, and we have found out that we, we can't do it that way, but um, we will let pro, uh, projects that have less than $25,000 of acquisition and improvements in them uh, if, you can, if you can justify that expense. Um, but I think we have, uh, and we'll see in the next slides, um, uh, lots of good ways to meet the national objectives to move properties through the program and, have, and to stop you know, tracking them for NSP purposes. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, but they're going to be different than this $25,000 uh, sort of loophole, so to speak. So next slide. Okay, so now we'll talk about disposition. So you've acquired a property. Uh, you've demolished it, um, so now what are you going to do with it? So we've split it up into eligible uses, just so you can see the different options that you have. Um, housing, obviously the easiest, we talked about that. You know, in that case, your demolition will just be part of your construction costs. Um, this new activity that was added in the closeout notice, um, where you can dispose of a property for special economic development activities, so this is great, and, and this is only eligible for NSP2 and NSP3 under eligible use B, so those properties have to be foreclosed or abandoned to be able to do this activity with NSP funds. Um, and we have what the national objectives are, either jobs, area, um, just some examples. And so the examples for that would be an in-home daycare where you're creating new low-mod jobs, or you could sell the land for a corner grocery store in a low mod area. Just some examples. Again, this chart is going to be in the guidance, so you can refer to it. And then the newest um, option that we're adding in this guidance piece that we haven't, you know, we talked about on the webinars, but we haven't um, actually put out is this disposition for ineligible activities. So that mean a national objective. So if you demolish a property, um, you acquire and demolish your property with NSP funds, you can then move to uh, dispose of that property for what we're calling ineligible activities that meet a national objective. So something like donating land to a, to a nonprofit to develop community gardens. Um, that's not something you can do in NSP2 and NSP3, uh, so this is a way for you to do it. You can't use those funds to develop that. Um, you can just acquire the land with the funds, get the property ready, and then come in with some other, other funds and uh, develop the garden. Right, so you, so you acquire it and you demolish it, and it, by demolishing it you meet an area uh, national objective, but you still have to meet, uh, you still have to uh, dispose of it, well, I mean, you don't have to, but presumably you want to, so in order to dispose of it, the eligible activity w is disposition, and so the subsequent use really can be a, 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 a use that's not allowed under NSP, but you're having you're using disposition, but as long as it meets a national objective uh, for the disposition activity, then then you're going to be good. So that's that's how we see a lot of these properties moving on. I mean, this is where uh, Ohio and Michigan and Indiana, the kinds of uses they wanted to uh, put these properties to, are these kind of low-level uh, neighborhood improvement sort of things. And so this should take care of most of those. Yeah. And we also talked about before, you know, if you so you buy a piece of land, you demolish a property on it, now you've got, you know, a vacant a piece of vacant land and you want to develop a, a park on it. So you just need you need other funds besides the NSP funds to build the park. Um, 
but it meets a national objective, you can show it's an area benefit, so that's how it works. Um, the other thing worth noting on here is disposition as an end use, and that's our way of allowing side lots. Um, so you can see on this chart when a side lot is eligible, um, and this is something we want to be clear about. Side lots can uh, meet a national objective through the area benefit, so you don't have to uh, income qualify the neighbor who you're giving or selling this or leasing the side lot to. Um, you, it just has to be in an area that meets the area benefit criteria because you're going to meet that you're going to meet that national objective with the demolition so it's basically an NSP and this is NSP only you're just sort of carrying that national objective over into the side lot when you donate it sell it or lease it so you'll see that on this chart as well i think we can go to the next slide yeah, so again, you're just seeing the same things, the same eligible, use, or eligible activities that you can do under each eligible use with the national objectives. Um, the key here I wanted to point out is under eligible use E, just always keep in mind that <clears throat> under NSP2 and NSP3, there's this restriction for housing only activities. So if you buy a piece of land that is vacant and that's the only way it qualifies in the program, it's not foreclosed, it's not abandoned, it's not blighted, it's only vacant, then the only thing you can do on that property is build housing. And that's an NSP2 and NSP3 restriction and that's not something that we can get away from. So that's the one time when that's your only disposition strategy. Unless you, if you remember back to that change of use slide, at that point you want to reimburse the program um, for all NSP funds spent on that property, you can do that and then take the property out if there's if there's no need for housing on that property. Right. That that housing requirement comes straight from the Recovery Act, so it's a you know legislative mandate that we uh, we cannot uh, change. Yeah. Okay. That's so, it for yeah. So we just kind of wanted to remind you that these were. Um, out there, we've we've I think uh, sort of expanded the list of examples to include most of the things that we've heard that people want to do. Uh, and I think the side lot piece and the and the disposition for a subsequent use that doesn't meet a uh, it's not an NSP eligible use uh, is uh, are going to be pretty good categories for. Uh, uh, resolving most of these, and, and these are going to affect. These could affect what you have in your land banks as well. And the land banks uh, have some other examples in the closeout notice. So uh, you may have properties in your land banks for quite a while, but uh, you will uh, once you meet these requirements, you won't have to be tracking them for HUD purposes anymore. So, um, so we hope that these are going to allow everyone to uh, you know kind of keep their programs moving and not have to get too hung up on. Um, additional reporting for uh, uh, you know the next 10 years or whatever. So, uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay. So, imagine a drum roll in your mind. Da -da -da -da. Uh, so, Lake Worth, Florida, has won the marketing contest award. They have submitted not only the best but uh, clearly the most uh, marketing materials. Um, Joan Oliva and uh, Suzanne Cabrera and uh, the whole team down there have done a, a great job, uh, met their uh, SP2 expenditure requirement and they have just uh, some really cool graphics and this is some stuff that we just use that we want to bring people's attention to that's on the website, that's on the resource exchange under multimedia and it's got its own little category called marketing materials uh, in the M section of the uh, uh, the uh, resource exchange uh, multimedia section, so you can easily find it. And uh, and Joan and her staff will will, will share a, a $100 award uh, that was be, being awarded by a private donor, not non-governmental funds. Uh, and so uh, Jennifer and I are going to go down there next week and <laughs> make the presentation <laughs> in conjunction with about 12 other things that we're doing down there. So. So anyway, so we, you know, we think that you're going to be, uh, once you get your TPR straight, um, you'll be still trying to sell off properties, and I think that's going to be a big uh, focus over the next couple of years um, as you wind down your program. So we're going to be coming up with some more material, and we encourage you to continue to post your marketing materials um, uh, so that others can share them and uh, get ideas and whatnot. All right, well, I think that's the end of the uh, 
informational slides, yes. So, uh, Jane, do you want to take people through this? Sure. Uh, I'll do that. Thank you all. A um, lot of good information and, and reinforcing information and some new information. Um, so I'm sure um, there will be lots of questions. Just as a reminder, um, to ask a question in writing, you can type your question in the box titled Q&A on the right side of your screen and then hit Send. Over the telephone, if you select the hand icon located in the upper right-hand side of your screen under the participant box, we will be then be able to see that you have a question and the host, we will unmute your line when it's your turn to ask a question. Just remember to click on the hand icon again once your question is answered so that we can remove you from the queue and move on to somebody else. Um, I do see that there are some hands and some written questions. So, Irene, let's start with um, the uh, phone questions that are coming in, okay? Absolutely. So we're going to, our first question of the afternoon is from Cindy maxwell Bathia. So Dean is going to unmute your line, Cindy, and um, ask away. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually listening to um, the webinar for informational purposes, for CRA purposes. I'm a CRA officer, and I'm actually looking for uh, if there was a, a list of NSP grantees um, through the HUD website that I could maybe plug in my my assessment area or the area that I'm looking for because, um, you know, so that we can assist some of these organizations that are utilizing your program. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, because I think uh, the Office of the Controller of the Currency has uh, has granted CRA credits for activity that takes place in NSP target areas. Uh, some of you might know that. Hopefully most of you do. Um, Cindy, we have um, the NSP Resource Exchange um, has, is um, at www.hud.gov slash NSPTA as in technical assistance. And if you go to the, uh, there's tabs across the top. If you go to the grantee tab, you can look up any or all grantees from different years. Um, and uh, they have, there's contact information in there for everybody. There's a, well, there's a fair amount of downloadable stuff. I can't remember if I've downloaded anything lately. but Where, do, where am I looking again? So um, it's, there's a tab across the top, and, it's, and it should say grantees, and it's kind of about two-thirds of the way across um, uh, above the pictures. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah it's right there. Are you HUD.gov? No, it's uh, um, okay. HUD.gov uh, slash NSPTA. Okay. Then you hit grantees, and that'll take you to. You can pick a state, uh, and then it'll go to state municipalities and yeah. give you contact information. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So Irene? Looks like Cindy oh, was our only raised hands. We have several questions that have been typed in. If you can, if you'd like to volunteer to speak your question over the phone, please just click the raised hand next to your name in the, or in the participant box. Otherwise, Jane, um, oh, we've got Yvette Q with a question. Your line is unmuted. Um, thank you. I was wondering, how long do we have to keep the project files for the acquisition, rehab, and disposition? Uh, four years after your closeout date. So four years after closeout. And then for the mortgage assistance? All the same, I think. Yeah. Because the mortgage assistance, you have the affordability period. Would it be after the affordability period? I mean, you have to keep the files on the mortgage assistance for that period of time. You you will be tracking, as a part of your closeout, um, you will be tracking initially through DRGR and most likely later through IDIS if you are an entitlement city or county. You will be tracking the uh, continued affordability uh, on a little form that um, – you know, lists you know the the address and the type of assistance they received and the the uh, the, the term you know the date at which they have to uh, the house has to remain affordable. So um, and that'll just but but you know that's not going to be like all your files for all, you know all the detailed kind of files for every house. 
So about four years would be the yeah. timeline. Uh, okay, great. Okay. Thank you. And that form is called Attachment E and will be found in the CPD closeout notice. Right. right. That will eventually be published. Whatever gets out of our attorney's hands, yes. And we're going to rename that form the Hunter Kurtz Memorial Template. I'm alive, John. <laughs> <laughs> Not at this rate. <laughs> Thank you, Yvette, for your question and panelists for that information. If anyone else would like to raise their hand and ask their question over the phone line, please do so. We've got a question from Ebony B. Your line will be unmuted. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a general question uh, regarding NSP. We are in the phase of planning for our disposition on our properties, and we've noticed in some areas um, that we've purchased, some of the purchase prices in running the comps have uh, you know, gone up, in, which is good in some of the areas above and beyond what we even even invested in the property. Um, it's our intention to, of course, keep our program going as long as possible, and we understand that you can't sell the property for more than what has been invested into it, but is there, are there any exceptions um, to that so that we're able to capitalize on the improvements in the area and maybe increase the program income to keep the program going a little bit longer? Um, that's a good question, Ebony. Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, one that's really available to everybody uh, and a, you know, pretty straightforward is would be a shared appreciation mortgage kind of arrangement where you are making a, a you know, it's a form of recapture uh, of, of, your, of your money, of your loan, but it allows you to uh, share in some of the upside, um, you know, in the future. Uh, so, you know, this is a particularly beneficial where the values are really low and, and you know, it can be expected to go up, uh, you know, in the next few years. Uh, and, and I would think that's, that's probably the case where you are. Um, the, um, the other way is, well, so, so we have a rule that says that you, can, that you cannot sell a house for more than the, uh, the lower of the appraised value or the total development cost. In our program, it's almost always the appraised value that's the lower. Um, but that really only applies to foreclosed properties. So um, if, you can, if you have abandoned or a vacant property, um, you could sell it you know, for, I mean, you still can't sell it for more than the appraised value, but, um, um, you know, and again, I, I mean, it's going to be a while before the appraised value is more than you put in it, but... Um, at, at oh, let me, let me ask this, because in some of the, what we've done is run comp analysis for the sales in the areas where the properties are, and we have, just to give an example, we maybe paid 80000 for a property and put $10,000 worth of rehab into it, <clears throat> you know, plus our carrying costs. So our total expenditure on the property may be 95000 but the average uh, sales price in that neighborhood may be 130000 so we're significantly, you know, we're priced, if we were to sell it based on what we put into it, we're, we're priced lower, but we were trying to figure out if there was a way for us to be able to capitalize on the improvements in the area and improve the um, program income so that we can keep the program going longer. Right. Well, like I say, I mean, you can, you can capture some of that difference um, through a shared appreciation mortgage, um, but although you wouldn't get that until the property is sold. Um, and, or, uh, and that would work for a foreclosed property. If the property was not foreclosed, then you can sell it for the appraised value, even if it's higher than the total development cost. But one thing to point out, though, is if a property is vacant and foreclosed, it's always foreclosed. Right. So you can't have, you can have an abandoned, vacant, and foreclosed property. We still count it only as foreclosed. So the um, foreclosed trumps everything. Okay, our next question is from Lois Colson. Your line will be unmuted. Hi, y'all. Um, I was just writing notes from the last conversation. Let me go back to my question. Um, can eligible use E properties, just go back to your chart about um, national objectives and where we can meet them, eligible use E properties be used for side lot disposition if the side lot 
uh, if the adjacent owner is residential and the lot is going to be, the NSP2 lot is going to be used as residential, it's like joining the two lots together to be one residential use. So it's yeah. still housing. Well, we will And if we income qualify that adjacent owner. Yeah, it's actually not housing. So that's why okay. NSP2 and 3, you couldn't do it under E um, mm -hmm. because there's no... We're not income qualifying the neighbor, and you're not um, going to have affordability restrictions associated with that property. It's going to be a low mod area benefit. And it's essentially, you know, you're taking the, the national objective you met with the demo. If it's a blighted property... And so, okay, let me stop you there, because the demo to me didn't really resonate, because I'm not worried about... We didn't do demo on these properties. Okay. Was, was your chart only referencing when demo's involved? Yeah, I don't think so. If you're not doing demo, you're not meeting national objective. Uh, right. So we're not we're not doing demo. The national objective, if we did income qualify the adjacent owner and we did put restrictions on the new property and what they could do with it in terms of if they sold it, they'd have to do re, you know resale provisions. Um, would that then bring it into the LMMH national objective? No, I mean I think it's so it's it's basically it's it's not a housing activity. So if you bought the property with NSP two and three and it was only vacant and not any other eligibility category, uh huh, um, then you'd have to actually build housing. You Okay, so that leads me to my second question. So we've spent less than twenty five thousand dollars, let's say, on this fictitious same property. Uh, on basically admin of acquiring and closing, and uh, it's okay. So you've, we've now decided. Oh, after looking at this further, it's only eligible E. We cannot don't you know it can't be a side lot, so it's not eligible anymore. But we've spent money on it. Is this something we have to pay back, or is this something that we can put into the admin pot of money and call it pre-planning and uh, I forget what the terms are, pre-development and planning costs. Yeah. Well, okay. basically, if you if you purchased a property and it only fits under LWC E and you can't do housing, you would have to reimburse the program for everything that was spent on that property yeah, as a way to take it out of the program. Once you buy it, Lois, you're you you're out of the uh, you know activity delivery mode, and you know you've 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 done an activity, so you have to undo it basically. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if I mean, if it can count in any way as foreclosed or abandoned or blighted. Um, then that no, it can't. And we would build on it, but it's not a buildable lot. It's it's like a irregular lot. So you would build on the <laughs> lot next door? Is that what you're saying? No, the lot next door already has a house. Okay. So there's already and there's we've already income qualified the lot next door, yeah. and they're eligible, and they want to take the property, you know, purchase the property and and subdu subdivide it with their property as a residential, basically as a side lot or whatever, uh, driveway, yard, whatever. Um, if, if they're willing to pay you something for it, then you would just have to make up the difference for you know to reimburse the program with. Um, okay. Or you could still, yeah. If it, I mean, you could still do it. It just is going to cost you something. Okay. So for still back to my second question, then, if we've spent under twenty five thousand on properties, not for acquisition, but for planning, for like surveys. Um, uh, the other surveys and engineering or not even designs it was some other term and there's no way to finish the development of these lots within the time frame of NSP would yeah. we be able to put those expenditures into our planning and pre-development admin the, acquired the property the, pro the problem is that yeah, once you acquire it and you can't meet a national objective anything that's associated with that address can't meet a national objective, so it's got to be reimbursed. But if you haven't acquired, if you've not acquired the property, and you've only well, done we owned the yeah we owned the property before NSP. I mean, these are all the basically, for lack of a better term, for for everyone else, they're land they've been land banked for well, for a while since 2005. As long as you're charging only, you know, activity delivery type costs, pre-development costs to the NSP program, then I think you could charge those as, you know, failed activity uh, costs. I mean, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't want to do, you know, millions of dollars worth of that, but you could do. No, yeah. We have about 30 properties that we did some survey, um, and I'm still blanking on the other pre-development term that someone survey and something else. 
under it's literally under a thousand dollars actually each property um, but they're just not going to be able to be developed in time under the because there's no the, we don't have any other financing that's going to go towards these same properties so it's going to just take time for them to actually get developed they'll still be developed eventually but it, it would almost be considered you'd have to land bank them or something but and they're e you say you don't have enough time i mean you, you're saying you have to spend all your funds for the expenditure deadline, correct? No, no, no. I'm saying uh, they're not land bankable. They're eligible to E, and they would they would be sitting there for uh, I don't know how long. Okay. Which means yeah. yeah. Okay. As, as long as you don't, as long as you don't have an acquisition or you know any kind of improvement, then uh, I, I think that's acceptable, Lois. Yeah, because I, I guess in the spirit of what that's meant for, that that is actually what happened, you know, doing surveys and sort of evaluation due diligence of the properties and then determining. And then the same partner has 30 others that they are developing with the NSP2 funds and finishing and meeting a national objective. It's just that these 30 are not going to make it into the yeah. pipeline. That's why you do pre-development reviews. To exactly. And the bad ones, right. Yeah, I don't see that as a problem. I think that's Okay. <laughs> Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Lois. Just a quick housekeeping note. Once you've asked your question of the panelists, please um, select that hand icon again to unraise your hand. Um, otherwise, I'll assume you have another question and we'll be calling on you again. So that would be helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mike Shepard. Your line is going to be unmuted. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have uh, our main program is acquisition and rehab. We were able to get 13 homes. Uh, we have three homes that are still not sold, and our program, the expenditure deadline, ends next week for us. How are we going to be able to pay for the taxes on the properties, um, lawn cutting services like that? Uh, well, um, if you have program income, that's typically going to be the way that, uh, you know, would be sort of your first choice if you have uh, any kind of sales proceeds from some of your other properties, for example. Those we sure of, do. Those kind of activities are eligible as disposition. Um, so, you know, the maintenance and the upkeep and, you know, board up and, you know, shoveling snow and whatever uh, are all uh, considered to be part of disposition because you have to maintain the asset in order to dispose of it. Uh, down the road. So uh, for those who don't have program income, um, it's a little bit more difficult. So a lot of them can hopefully use some um, CBG or other kinds of funds, but um, the, the, the most logical source would be program income. Okay. And do those get recorded in the QPRs afterwards or the yeah. after the line? Right. So okay. you won't be able to close your grant until you have them all occupied. So you know, by yep. that time, um, you know, you, you may not be reporting on them anymore, and then after closeout, you'll, you'll you'll move to an annual performance report. Uh, I mean, you at the expenditure deadline, all we're requiring is that you spend an amount equal to your grant. If you're bringing a program income, then you have more money than your initial grant. So you're going to still have money to spend even though after your expenditure deadline. Yeah, we, we were. We, at I'm sorry, we were at 2.1 million to meet, and we've already expended 2.5. So yeah. and we've got plenty of program income. Right, right. Yeah, you, you're still going to be rolling along. So that's that's okay. Part. Great. Thanks. Yeah, and until you know, it's, until you get to close out and even beyond, it's going to look very much like the program that you're running now. So same activities, same national objectives. You know, so it shouldn't really be uh, all that radical a departure. But, you know, but, I mean, everybody's realizing that at some point their money runs out and that, you know, if they still have properties they're taking care of, uh, they've got to find another source of funds. Great. Thank you, Mike, for your question. Our next question comes from in Albert Ramos. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, we purchased three uh, vacant, not, not, we purchased three lots and with blighted structures on it, we demolished them under activity uh, MUSD as a doctor. And um, we are planning on donating those lots to um, a non for profit organization. It's called the Wounded Veterans, and they, they're planning on building homes there to provide for. Uh, hopefully wounded veterans or qualifying buyers, low income. Mm -hmm. And my question is, when did we meet or when do we meet the national objective? Is that when at the time that the properties were uh, 
demolish, or do we have to wait after they build the homes and then occupy by uh, low-income people? Well, so you, I, assuming, I'm assuming that it's going to be a little while before these houses get built. Is that correct? Yes, uh, because we are, I mean, we're already demo the places. This happened a little bit ago, but now we're donating these lots to uh, this uh, organization for them to build the homes and uh, give, give it or sell them to uh, wounded veterans, preferably. Mm -hmm. But are we talking like a year from now those houses will be built? Uh, it could be like a year, maybe it could be six, 18 months or so. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to try to answer this. John could chime in. But I, you want to meet the, if they were blighted properties and you bought them under LWSD, you want mm -hmm. to show that you know, they were eligible as blighted and that you met a national objective, so it would be area benefit. Um, for the demolition. Right, for the demolition. Yeah, we did. No, no doubt we have pictures on everything. Okay, so you can show it was like a safety hazard and, you know, you were... Yes. So you met a national objective at that point. Um, if you're going to donate the properties to the nonprofit to build housing, that would be a change of use. Um, so you're going to change the national objective essentially. But I think it's, it's basically when you decide to close out because you've yeah. met you you know you'll meet you've met the national objective on those properties. Um, but if you close out, you know, after they build housing, then you're going to want to change the national objective. Well, no, I think you. I mean, it's just a disposition. So you you have you, you're going to meet a you're going to meet a national objective with the disposition. Now here, if you're going to be selling or, or giving these properties to a group that's going to make them available for wounded veterans, I'm, I, I would guess that you know these are going to be low, moderate, or middle income people, and so you'll be yeah. able to meet a housing objective after you've got occupancy on them. Um, I don't, but I don't think you'll be able to meet it before that time. So. You okay. So basically, I have to wait until these homes are occupied to close the program. If you built them with, yeah, if you if you used you know your original line of credit money, not program income, then yes. I mean, all the closeout will cover all of your original grant amount, which is the money that came from your line of credit. So. Um, mm -hmm. For some for some reason that you you know you acquired these and demolished them out of program income, then you, you might be able to close without that. For, but usually you're going to have to meet that national objective first, and you know we'll just you know we'll just wait. I mean there isn't a deadline okay. for closeout, so. Okay, and, and I mean they are very effective. I'm, I'm expecting them to do it in 18 months, or, or at least that's our target. Uh, it could be less, but. Uh, okay. Okay, but that was my question. How's your market down there? Is it picking up? Uh, this in Orlando is is really picking up a lot. Okay. It's, it's moving forward. A lot of activity. Uh, really hard to find for close homes. Uh, uh, a lot of investors. A lot of cash investors. So it's picking up heavily. And that in California and Arizona too. So good news and bad. Right. Yeah, it's, it's 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 good. It's good for the market. So I'm happy for that. And we got some good houses. We're we're going to be able to sell fairly fast. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your help. Okay. Thank you, and Albert, for your question. Our next question comes from Janine Sutton. Your line will be unmuted. Hi. Thanks for taking our uh, our question. I'm not Jeannie. I'm Sean Tan. Um, so sorry about that. Okay, so um, we're looking at reacquiring uh, re an NSP property. Uh, we've got a second lien on it, and um, we're looking at paying off the first loan. Uh, and then we might, in that case, we might put in about, about three thousand dollars in cleanup. So my question is, what is the maximum sales price um, of of the house once we reacquire it? Can we include the second lien onto the sales price? Where does the second lien come from? Second lien is from the um, from the subsidy that we provide uh, for the property we just foreclosed and then we rehab and sold to a um, individual who later decided that he wanted a house. Maybe back up and tell us what happened with the house. So you you used NSP money to rehab this house and sold it to a home buyer. That's correct. And the home buyer decided that well he didn't want this property. So um, he's, he's taking the house into foreclosure. It's, it's, uh, that's a list pendants now on the property. 
and we're looking at reacquiring back the property because the person has only lived in the house maybe for less than a month. Um, so if we were to purchase the house and by, by paying off the first lien from the, from the bank, um, we want to know uh, what is the... Our new basis. Yeah, what's the, what's the maximum sales price we, can, we are allowed to sell on this, on this house? Well, I mean, I, I, don't th I don't think you could add back, you know, the loan that you've already put on as a second. Um, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know, those things are kind of dependent on the, the buyer. Um, I, you know, I'm just not really sure. I, I, I'm going to have to ask you to write that one into our um, ask a question line. I think we're going to have to kind of think about that a little bit, and I don't want to just fire off an answer because it's, it's a good question, but uh, I, don't, I, I don't really know. Uh, for sure. Try to give us a sequence of events, you know, kind of how much you put into it, how much the, how much the bank loan was, um, and then we can try to get you something back. And just put, when you send that in, put direct to HUD on, on, on the top of it, and then the, the people that manage that um, inbox can, will send it straight over to us. And you know where that is, correct? Yes. Okay. It's on the, the 1CB website, if any of you don't know where that is. Um, yeah, and uh, just provide us all the details you can. Yeah. What's okay, we'll do. A month. It's Thank like, you very much. You've got to be able to get like an annulment after, uh, after <laughs> three weeks or something. Jeez. The ink's not even dry. Mm. Wow. Okay, thank you. At this point, we don't have any hands raised. I invite anyone to do a quick hand raise. Otherwise, I will hand it over to Jean for some written entries. Yeah, we do have a number of written entries, so maybe I'll take it on, and then we'll give people time to raise their hand. Um, first, we have Christy Lanf uh, Lanfair, um, and I think it's related to the Ryan, the discussion about the QPR. And um, so the question is, do you need to enter a narrative in the QPR for it to show up for the field office to view? No. That's no is the answer. It, the, it, the, the narrative is just going to provide the field office rep the information that they'll need to understand where, you know, what, where the expenditures came from. The, just by, you know, by submitting your QPR, the QPR itself will, will you know, show this amount when it's submitted to your, to your HUD rep. Uh, it'll show the amount that you've entered. So there's no, you know, there's no connection to entering an, a, a, anything in the narrative um, and that, you know, therefore then showing. Uh, anytime you take an action uh, for an activity, it'll show up in the QPR for a, a review. Anytime you enter information or change data. Okay. Um, let us know if that completely answers your question, Christy, and then we can um, follow up if necessary. The next written question comes from Stella Chu. Um, and this is a question that's been asked on other webinars, and it's always worth repeating. Can NSP-1 and NSP-3 funds be combined to fund one property for acquisition and rehabilitation? Yes, as long as the uh, property meets the eligibility requirements for NSP-1 and NSP-3. And they're in the same, and they're the, both in, in target, target areas. areas. Yeah, both in target areas. Okay. Uh, Stella, again, if that responds to your question, let us know. Joanna Balsama Lillian um, asked the question, what about donating the property to a church? And this is referring back to your presentation um, on the new uh, guidance to be issued. What about donating a property to a church under D whose congregation may not primarily be low-moderate income? Um, well, I guess it would depend on the use of the property. I mean, if it's just going to be for the church to use as a, you know, parking lot maybe, or they're going to build a cafeteria or something like that, then, um, I, I, I mean, I think you have a problem with the subsequent use. I mean, the only time you can really donate a property f for, uh, without worrying about the uh, meeting a national objective, uh, 
of the of the receiving party is uh, is if you're doing it as a side lot. I mean, I think this would be. This, you know, this is not a side lot kind of scenario, unless I'm misunderstanding. Well, if they're going to build housing on the property, yeah. I mean, if, they're, if the church is going to build a, uh, you know, housing units for uh, folks that will meet the, uh, you know, 120 sure. percent um, requirement, then yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess the answer is it would it, you you would have to meet a national objective for that disposition, um, you know, in some way and. Uh, Either through create, creating housing or through uh, some other means uh, th that we've shown, and um, it, it's not really the same as a side lot in a residential setting. Though no, that's that's maybe taking it a little too far. But if you want to expand on that or you know call in and, and discuss it, uh, you know we're we're sort of guessing at some of the details yeah. here. That'd be a good one to to talk to you about. Okay. Um, this one, next one also may warrant some follow-up from the uh, questioner. Victor Banks, um, dot, 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 so you do not need to track or report proceeds, no need to prorate for future reporting. I'm assuming you were referring to the conversation that was ongoing, and it's a little difficult to track. I don't know if any of the HUD staff can relate back to what we might have been talking about. Um, no. I'm not sure no. Sure. Yeah. About. yeah. I, I mean, Victor, um, I'm going to ask you if you could hit your um, uh, hand icon and ask the question verbally and refer us back to what um, your question is about. That would be helpful. Write some more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next question, Lois Coulson, I know you asked a question verbally. Can eligible use E properties be disposed of as a side lot? We covered that one. I'll skip that one on. Um, okay, Darren Madkin. If a grantee acquires a track of abandoned homes for demolition under eligible use E and subsequently sells the property to a developer for development of affordable housing, is that an eligible disposition of the property? Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like it. Um, I mean, you've you've demolished it. I mean, if they if they were abandoned and you and the demolition meets an area benefit national objective, which typically is what it would meet, then the then the next national objective it goes along with the disposition, and you can sell it or donate it or or otherwise dispose of it to uh, somebody that's going to do something uh, that meets a national objective like affordable housing. Then that should be fine. Okay, I think we have one more written in question here. Uh, Craig Goebel, for grantees who have met their overall expenditure requirements for NSP 1 and NSP 3, how long will HUD permit them to spend NSP grant and program income to reach their 25% low mod, that's the LH25 requirement, um, and, will, and what will be their closeout dates? You can't close out your grant until you've spent 25% of your initial grant set aside um, towards meeting the 25% uh, set aside requirement. So uh, you know you you're going to want to close out your grant, and uh, you could face some real issues if you don't eventually meet that requirement. Um, now with the program income 25% set aside requirement. We, uh, you know, we know we sort of uh, had to unfortunately change the uh, um, our interpretation of the legislation uh, during the process or during the, you know, the couple years this grant has been open. Um, so we'll work with you to try to find ways for you to meet that 25% uh, requirement. But for the initial uh, grant amount, um, you know, there you got to meet that. And uh, if you're having problems. You know, think about getting some technical assistance or uh, contacting your field office. Pretty much as long as it takes is how long we will <laughs> be there with you. Okay. Um, again, if there's follow-up on that, please send it in or raise your hand. Lois Coulson, um, back to the change of use versus ineligible activities. 
that don't meet a national objective. Can expenditures less than 25K for properties that are no longer feasible in NSP2? I think we answered mostly, one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Awesome. I'll attest. No problem. Carmen Files. If a property under eligible use E is sold to a home buyer to be utilized as a side lot, what restrictions must the home buyer comply with during the five year change of use period? Um, there, well, there is no change of use period in that case because you, you, you've reached, that property has reached its ultimate sort of beneficiary and um, the change of use only applies when it's still in the program or, you know, like a nonprofit is operating a community center in the property or the city still owns it or whatever. But once it's reached, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you give that property as a side lot or sell it as a side lot to uh, a resident, um, it's out of the program at that point. And the five years that you normally have in the change of use uh, uh, clock just no longer uh, uh, pertains. And that's only eligible if it's NSP1. You can only do a side lot under NSP1 under eligible use E. Okay. Thank you. Carmen, if you have any follow-up, please let us know, either in writing or by raising your hand. Anne Lean is the next written question. I understand from the closeout notice that we have 90 days to draw in DRGR but I just heard, referring to the discussion earlier in this webinar, uh, just heard that you say that we have 30 days. No, no, what no, no. Will, oh, I'm sorry, please continue the question. <laughs> what will happen after the 30 days? Okay, there, there's a little confusion here about um, closeout and uh, the expenditure requirement. The closeout is when every property is met a national objective, whether that's through uh, what Jen's talking about for demolition or that's through building a house and getting an eligible family into the home to meeting you know, a housing uh, national objective. Th that is a process that is going to take months, if not years from now. Um, we have not, we will not be able to close out anybody uh, at least until this summer, probably even uh, until uh, the fall. So that is, that's separate entirely from the expenditure uh, deadline. And that 90 days she, she's referring to is um, a process that will uh, revolve around when you've determined that you've met all your national objectives and you're working with the field offices uh, your field office to actually close out your grant. Um, so that that will happen when you've really drawn down all your funds and met all your national objectives. That that's a that's a future activity that we'll uh, we'll discuss in some more detail hopefully in the next month or two. Um, the uh, expenditure deadline uh, is the date you know that is required by statute that you spend. Um, 100% or in for NSB3 at this point, 50% of your grant funds. Um, and that date uh, will, if you do not spend 100% or for NSB3, 50, by that date you're going to get a finding. Um, and 30 days after that date you have a chance to sort of um, prove that the finding's wrong and reconcile your accounts. Um, enter in uh, expenditures um, that you receive. For instance, the administrative expenses that you incur the day of uh, your deadline. So today, say today is your deadline and your staff is uh, working away until you know 11.30 tonight trying to get everything in. Well, they've incurred and expended those funds, but obviously you're not going to, uh, uh, you know, not going to be able to enter that in today. Well, you, you missed the deadline by, you know, a 1%. Well, that, that expenditures of that admin time today will put you over. So tomorrow you put it in your uh, QPR. Um, so that's what we're talking about for the 30-day uh, window to, to reconcile your files. And, you know, then you can prove to your field office that you've uh, met the expenditures deadline and they will uh, rescind the finding. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Shannon Scott um, has a, two questions. How will the NSP-1 and NSP-3 
developers who are allowed to keep proceeds need to track the proceeds after both grants are officially closed out? Um, and will the developer need to be sending a report on a periodic basis? And then second, how long will they need to report to us after the grant is closed out? Well, uh, okay, so the, the answer depends on whether they're really developers or not. Um, and there's been quite a bit of confusion about this, uh, actually. So uh, primarily, the, the organizations that carry out uh, housing activities fall into the, either the subrecipient uh, category, which would be a unit of government or a nonprofit, or they fall into the developer category, which would be either a nonprofit or a for profit uh, company. So if your development agreement and your, uh, you know, clearly specifies that, these, that, uh, that this is a developer, your underwriting is supposed to take into account the amount of the funds that would be uh, returned to them through rental income or sales proceeds or whatever, and, and your underwriting uh, and your, your, the amount of money that you put in the deal should, should take that into account because they don't earn program income. If it's a developer, it is not program income unless you specifically call for some sort of repayment of that. Um, and, some, and some grantees do that. Uh, you, you, you can negotiate anything you want, but you know, in general, unless you specify otherwise, uh, proceeds that, that go to developers are not considered program income. Now, in the event that they are program income, or in the event that it's really a subrecipient acting as a, you know, sort of, you know, doing developer-like things but still being a subrecipient, um, you would be, um, you know, program income. You know, it's program income for as long as it's coming in, and it, and it would, you would be reporting on it. Uh, in perpetuity, basically. So, I mean, you know, there's some grants out here that I can imagine easily will be still uh, receiving payments in, in 10 years from now, uh, may, maybe not a lot. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the big distinction is if it's really a developer, then you, you don't have to track it. If it's a developer that is required to pay money back to you as a, through a loan, for example, instead of a grant, or if it's a subrecipient that's paying money back to you, then um, that program income uh, will will go on pretty much forever. Um, you know, if you're a nonprofit, it might be a little. I mean, if you're if you're an SP2 nonprofit, it might be a little bit different. But for everybody that has a, an ongoing CBG program, you'll be reporting it um, alongside your CBG program income. Okay. Shannon, hopefully that answers the question. If not, please raise your hand or type in another question for follow-up. Deborah McRae is asking for a clarification between the pre-acquisition costs that do not have to be paid back if a national objective is not met as compared to the, the acquired costs of a project that cannot be completed. Does this cost have to be paid back? So the, the big distinction here is that you, if you have acquired the property or made any kind of improvements to a property, then um, you, uh, you would be reimbursing those costs if you can't meet a national objective. If it's just pre-development costs, though, and Lois was talking about this, you know, there, it's just the environmental review or the or the, the engineering or you know soil analysis or whatever you know kinds of things that you do um, that lead you to conclude that you don't want to buy that property. That is an eligible uh, activity delivery cost that you can add to your uh, whatever activity you're in. You know, under acquisition, for example, what? I don't know what that. On that we cut that shot. Uh, it's pre-development. It is. <laughs> um, so um, yeah. So, but you know, once you've once you've acquired it, you you're in a different category. You're in a different game. Um, and so that's the big distinction. Um, those kind of costs can be written off uh, if if they if they never resulted. You know, if they if if they led you to avoid acquiring it. But once you do acquire it, then uh, you have to meet a national objective or you have to take it out of the program. Okay, that's a question that's been asked a couple of different times, not necessarily on this call, but um, we will continue to raise that for um, the grantees. Colleen Christie has a question um, also for clarification. 
in order to meet the 100% expenditure deadline, grantees are required to expend 100% of grant funds originally awarded to the grantee, original grant funds being exclusive of the program income received. That's, that's Correct? No, no. It's an amount equal to uh, program income expended and grant funds. Uh, OMB is a requirement that any program income earned has to be spent before you could spend a uh, grant funds. So we, um, in a, through I can't remember if it was correction or the NSP2 notice, somehow we changed that uh, because that was the initial interpretation, but we've changed it. So now all you need to do is spend an amount equal to your grant allocation. So if you got $10 million and you expended $5 million of your um, Line of, line of credit and five million of program income, then you have met your requirement. Let's uh, let's go back to this uh, previous question again, though. Um, in, in the case uh, that was being cited previously, the the grantee had not acquired the property. I mean, they owned the property, but they had not put any money, any NS, NSP funds into it, except for pre-development costs. So, in my mind, that's the same as not acquiring it because they didn't. They didn't acquire or improve it, you know. So I just want to be a little more clear with people. Um, so, but once you once you spend NSP money to to do something with it, acquire, demolish, or whatever, then you are uh, you are uh, requiring yourself to meet a national objective or uh, or reimburse the program, basically. Okay, we have a question from Lauren Yoder. Do we have to recertify income? Do we have to recertify income on an annual basis for a rental property that was deeded over to a church in order to comply with the 25% set aside? Yes, the green bubble. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Sure. Do we have to recertify income on an annual basis for a rental property that was deeded over to a church to comply with the 25% set aside? I, I, I'm a little confused by why the, it, I assume what they're saying is the church is managing the, uh, the, rent, the property. I'm um, presuming that correct also, and, yeah. And the requirement is that, um, you only have to certify the income of the tenant when they move into the property. So, um, yeah. So once the person moves in, say you know you have a five-year affordability period. Somebody moves in today um, and they live there for a year and a half. I don't need to recertify their uh, their income, but. Um, once uh, they leave and somebody else moves in, I need again to certify their income that they're uh, a below the 25% set aside. But we're not going to kick somebody out of their apartment because they've, uh, um, you know, gone from below 25% AMI to above, or I'm sorry, 50% AMI to above 50% AMI. Right. So every new tenant has to do an initial certification. Of yeah. Income. But that, but whenever that is, that has that goes on for the entire affordability period. Yeah. So it's five, ten, fifteen years, or whatever. So. Okay. Thank you. We have a question from Or Oravang, I believe. Um, goodness. A nonprofit land bank is an NSP grantee and owns a land bank property that it wants to rehab and sell. The property is located in a city that is also an NSP grantee and it is in an NSP target area. The city charges a fee for all plan reviews. The land bank wants the city to waive the fee. Can the city use its NSP funds to pay for this fee in lieu of the land bank paying for it, I presume? Uh, so well, if they can. I don't think you could require it. I mean, you know, um, I, I don't... I mean, so fees are fees can be paid when they are levied, you know, uniformly. So, you know, you can't... You couldn't charge only the NSP program uh, rehab fees, and everybody else doesn't have to pay fees. But 
most cities do this on a, on a uniform basis. So, um, but it sounds like the land bank, uh, you know, wants to get uh, wants to save a little bit of money by having uh, the city pay for the fee or waive it. Um, I, I, you know, I guess it, it could be uh, an eligible cost um, if it's in the city's target area and if the city has that kind of activity. But I, I don't. That it also, if they're separate grantees, that sounds like an administrative nightmare because you're going to then have to track the property in both. Uh, you know, you, both grantees are going to need to track the property in DRGR, and I mean that. It, it sounds like you're creating yourself a lot more work than it, it's probably worth for whatever the fee is. Because you know, you also can't. You know, now the say. It, it, I, I think I understood correctly that the land bank is a separate grantee. So say you know the uh, the city thinks it's all done to close out all its grant it, you know close out its grant but it's still sitting on uh, these properties that they paid the fee for they also can't close out until those properties have met a national objective so I mean you you know I'm, I'm not sure this is the uh, best thing to do. do yeah sounds like good advice Arvang if there is uh, additional follow up um, certainly. You can write in here or raise your hand or certainly using the uh, NSP resource um, technical assistance for greater clarification. We have a question here from Ryan. Um, if you get a finding for not meeting the 50% deadline and the finding is upheld and the grantee has not met the deadline, what happens next? Well, um, we will schedule an informal consultation, basically, to uh, uh, talk over what led to the uh, failure to meet the requirement and uh, talk about where the where the grantee is in terms of capacity um, and uh, make a decision about whether to uh, recapture funds or to uh, perhaps allow uh, some additional time. Uh, you know, if it if it seems warranted, um, so I, uh, yeah, they're they're de they're decided on an individual basis. Uh, uh, at this point, we have been running all of these through Deputy Assistant Secretary Yolanda Chavez, uh, and um, I think that will continue for the foreseeable future. It'll depend on how many actually, um, you know, end up in that situation. But certainly for the bigger ones, so uh, she's going to want to talk to you. So that's that's basically what happens. Um, I you know I can't really predict, predict the outcome of any individual circumstance, but it will be um, you will be you know explaining uh, what happened. Okay, thank you. Um, that appears to be all of the written questions that we have at this time. Uh, wanted to remind folks we still have a little bit of time. If you have a question that you want to ask over the phone, just click on the hand icon and it will show up and we will unmute your phone. Or you can type in your question on the right-hand side in the question and answer box and then hit send. Any other questions? Um, not seeing any. HUD staff, John, et cetera, any other comments? Somebody made a good suggestion that we should have some some made up questions and answers for these kind of situations. Um, we were in training last week, so we didn't get to do that. So uh, I think that's a good idea. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess our biggest thing has been kind of trying to figure out why um, grantees that are able to spend their money can't, um, can't show their expenditures in the QPR. Um, and I, I realize that it's a frustrating system and nobody, nobody likes it, but um, a lot of folks have been making it work. So, um, so you know, just pay attention to that. I, I think that's, that's our big uh, thing right now. We've gotten through about half of the uh, deadlines maybe a little more than half if you count NSP2. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still, we've still got dozens of, of missed uh, targets. So, um, you know, it's just, we, we, we think you can do better. 
So. Do you want to go back while we have a few moments here to that uh, slide with the QPR on it, just so everyone can see where to put their expenditure in? Just because you drew down the funds does not mean that we counted it. Uh, one more. Uh, just because you've drawn down the funds does not mean that it counts as an expenditure. You have to put the information in your current open QPR. Right. And as long as you save it, you don't have to submit it. So you open it up, you fill out the expended uh, little box, and then save the QPR, close it, and then when we pull reports, that shows up on our reports. So it doesn't have to be a submitted QPR. It can just be uh, your new one that will be due here in April, I guess. Um, and you just want to put the information in and make sure you save it. And you don't, they don't need all the documentation there either, right? I mean, yeah, you're, no. just, you're just putting in the amount expended for the activity. I mean, you need to have the documentation on file. Right. But um, you, you just, that's all we need to see right now, unless we're doing a voucher review or, you know, various other monitorings or things. But, you know, just that box. We might want to mention that we are um, we're thinking about some new webinars and some new possible new clinics this summer, and we will have um, a little uh, questionnaire that um, will be going out through the listserv that uh, invites you to make suggestions for the kinds of topics you'd like to see on the webinars and uh, and in person if we can uh, pull that off. Uh, one idea that we've had is to, it's actually Hunter's idea that, uh, you know, we have a lot of new staff coming into the program and um, everybody's pretty busy. We thought it might be useful to have sort of a one hour super overview of NSP and then a series of 15 or 20 minute um, little sort of pre recorded webinars that. Uh, you know, could look at an individual topic, eligible properties or national objectives or uh, whatever, so that uh, people could could kind of get it. It's like those, you know, 100-calorie packs of cookies, you know, that cost $9 a piece. But, um, but you know, they're pre-measured and they're sort of digestible and they won't make you fat. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the approach we're taking. So if you have any ideas like that, we are uh, open to uh, a lot of things. You know, I think that's one of the things we feel good about here is that we try to stay on top of what you need, and um, the best way is for you to tell us. So please do. I mean, if, if you forward the slides, we also, at the, the conclusion of this webinar, we do have a... Um, Survey Monkey, and we request your feedback. And there is a place there also for inserting um, any additional uh, information or webinar topics that you're interested in. Right. Do we have any more questions? Looks like we might, actually. Um, Get one from Richard Knight. Or did we already do Yes. No, no, we do. That just came in. Uh, Richard Knight is asking, will there be more NDC, Neighbor Neighborhood Development um, Council, courses offering to allow folks to finish underwriting series? Hmm. Um, we are not uh, sponsoring any additional ones this year through NSP. Um, NDC, uh, you know, offers those courses uh, uh, periodically throughout the year, generally a couple of times a year at least, as, uh, as I uh, recall seeing it. Um, but, well, yeah, we ran two, for the previous two years, we have run a total of close to 40 of those classes, and I think that's going to be, uh, that's probably going to be it for us. Um, but, you know, you can get out there and, and take them on your own. Okay. I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, anybody in the uh, participants want to raise their hand? Okay. Well, thank you all for your participation. Um, good luck as you're uh, approaching NSP deadlines. Hopefully this was information that was useful for you. We will look for the new guidance that um, Jennifer Hilton discussed about disposition and demolition properties. And this sure. is Hunter, just, just one last thing. I just want to point out that we'll be having another one of these webinars on Thursday the 21st. So that's a week from this Thursday.
terrific. Thank you, Hunter. Um, Thank you all. Those numbers better be better by that time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Take care.